Hey everyone, great to see so many of you here. A very exciting webinar coming up tonight. Uh, just before we get underway, which we'll do in about five minutes, could you just uh, please type into the chat box that I'm coming through here? Just need to check that everything's good technically. So if you could just type into the chat box if you can hear me now. Fantastic, thank you very much. Good oh, thanks. Thanks for that. Okay, I'll just um, put down the mic now and I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Hey guys, if you're just tuning in, we're just a couple of minutes away from uh, making a start now. So uh, put the kettle on, We've got a really great webinar coming up tonight and just a few more minutes away now. Hey, welcome everyone. Can see lots of people logging in now. Just a few minutes out. Just uh, make yourself a drink, get comfortable. We're getting going in about one minute's time.
Hey everyone, just about ready to start. Uh, but just before we do, uh, it's important for you to understand that you need to take care in applying what you will learn on tonight's webinar or any webinar or training for that matter. And um, you know, everyone's situation is different. And while we go to great lengths to ensure that everything we share is accurate, uh, what you're about to hear is based on our personal experience and opinions and is not intended to be specific to your circumstances. So in order for us to share this information openly in the way that we do, we do need to make the following disclaimer that we're not real estate agents, financial planners, lawyers or accountants and not liable for any loss, damage or misunderstanding caused by reliance on any of the information provided or inferred. With that out of the way, we'll get going in just a few moments. Hi everyone and welcome to this very exciting webinar, the Money Magazine Investment Property Shootout. My name's John Hubbard and if it's your first time on one of these webinars, a very warm welcome to you. And if you're a regular, welcome back. Uh, now we've got a lot to look forward to tonight because we're privileged to be joined by some fantastic expert guests. Uh, before we get to them though, I would like to give an introduction to our very special host because tonight our host is none other than the editor of Money Magazine and very successful investor in her own right, Effie Zahos. Now, Effie is one of the most respected personal finance experts in Australia today. She started her career in banking and later went on to become a finance journalist specialising in consumer finance and later becoming the head researcher for Channel 9's The Money Show. Today, she's a professional speaker, media commentator and editor of the fabulous Money magazine. But tonight, she's playing the role of referee. She'll be keeping everything fair and above board for our investment property shootout between Ben Kingsley, Peter Koulios and Jane Slack-Smith. So ladies and gentlemen at home, Ben, Jane and Peter, please give a warm hand for our host, Effie Zahos. Hello and thanks so much John for that generous introduction and thank you out there for joining us tonight. I really appreciate that you're taking the time to be here. Now I know that we're all busy but I think if you're interested in purchasing an investment property in the new future, particularly if you're on a tight budget, then tonight is definitely going to be worthwhile. Here's just some of the things that are coming up. You'll be shown a short list of areas in which to invest for just $30 per week or $150 per week and $250 per week. You'll hear about the cash flow formula for assessing investment properties at any price point and why it's so important to take action now before it's too late and the market moves out of reach. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg because this webinar is a shootout. <laughs> So let me take a moment to give you some background on how this webinar came about. In the special 2016 real estate edition of Money Magazine, which you can still buy at magshop.com.au, I asked tonight's three experts to come up with three investment scenarios to cater to a range of budgets between $30 per week and $250 per week. And did I detect a bit of friendly professional rivalry in this article? I must say. Now, without doubt that each of these guys are extremely successful investors in their own right. And each of them will be making a case for us tonight for investing at completely different price points and using different criteria. Okay, first up, Ben Kingsley, the Chair of Property Investment Professionals of Australia and Director of Empower Wealth, will put forward the case for investing on a budget of $250 per week. Author, teacher and the National Coordinator of Property Investment Training at TAFE SA, Peter Kalusis, will put forward his own case for investing on as little as $150 per week. And last but not least, Jane Slacksmith. She wrote a book about making a million dollars from just two investment properties and one renovation. And tonight she's putting forward an even bolder case for investing with just as little as $30 a week. I mean, how's that even possible? Welcome all. Are you up for this? Oh, absolutely. I'm ready. Bring it on. <laughs> ready to go. Gloves on. <laughs> okay, okay guys. So just before we get started, I invite you to stick around to the very end because I have a very special prize that I'll be giving away for one lucky person. Uh, yes, I've got some questions for you based on what's covered in tonight's webinar. 
And the first person to get that question right wins a one-year subscription to Money Magazine. I hope you like that. And we've got some other surprises and goodies to give away as well, so be sure to take notes and stay to the end. Okay, so let's get underway. Firstly, to open the argument, I'd like each of our expert guests to briefly outline the case for the scenarios they are putting forward. So let's start with you, Jane Slacksmith. Uh, thank you, Effie. Well, I'm glad I get to put my case forward first. Those boys, I think they're going to try to hog the limelight here. But uh, look, I, I think actually you gave me the most challenging case, which was uh, – getting an investment property that costs $50 a week. Now, I did actually take it a step further and get down to $30 a week, but I felt there was a bit of payback going on here because I know a few years ago I did get the $250 a week uh, scenario. So, uh, Ben, I think uh, you know, you're know you going to have to do a lot of work on this one to actually justify being the best strategy because oh, it's, it's hard doing it at $30 a week. Now, I guess the, the thing about uh, this scenario is obviously cash flow is really important. So we want to have a high yielding property. So I was looking in areas that had good rental yields. And, you know, the reason that that's important is obviously it's less money of our, out of our pocket week in, week out. But just having a property that goes, you know, makes you $30 a week, you know, over 10 years might make you somewhere around 15 grand. But if it's not going up in value, then you're still stuck with a $350,000 property and you're not actually creating more wealth for yourself. So I kind of stepped it up a little bit and I also targeted areas that had good capital growth opportunities as well because I wanted the cash flow and the growth. So I threw in a little bit of uh, renovation, which I might get into a little bit later as well but that in essence is my case mm, interesting guys what do you think well I think I mean, the I'll... <laughs> there's plenty of areas around australia where you can get high yields but that's the challenge in jane is trying to get that growth that sort of comes in behind that yield that's that's certainly what i'm looking forward to hearing you argue your point <laughs> on and Jane, okay, so I ben. To to what was that, Pete? I did a little bit of research, Jane. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of research, and I don't want to put you under any pressure, but you suggested more A field. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how much capital growth more A field has had in the last five years? I'm talking predicted growth, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's good, because the last five years has been zero. <laughs> Yeah. I'm looking for opportunity I'm, I'm ahead. Looking to this. <laughs> I, I, did, I, didn't, oh. I didn't know the banter was starting this quickly, Peter. If I actually yeah, I think under, Peter. You, did, you, did, you didn't even name a suburb, Pete. You just said somewhere in Adelaide. <laughs> yeah. like, you've got yourself out. I named really five top class blue chip suburbs. Oh, that's so true, Ben. It, it, yeah, look, keep it, keep it clean. But it's true. I mean, at least, Jane, you pinpointed an area and we did ask for future growth, if I may just say. But we have started early. Gee, I haven't even heard from Ben yet. So Ben Kingsley from Empower Wealth. Now, it sounds like Jane thinks your $250 per week case study was a walk in the park. What do you think? Well, she did. Oh, look, to be honest with you, I, I wish I had a surplus of $500 a week because it just means I'd be able to buy, you know, assets that are scarcer and better located. So, look, 250 still puts me in that sort of affordability price bracket. So it's still tough in that market because there's a lot of, you know, fool's gold in that particular marketplace as well. So that was the challenge. So when you sort of started to think about the actual suburbs and the areas that you're going to look at, that's probably where I had more of a challenge in terms of, um, she's right around the cash flow side of things. I've got a little bit more scope um, with regards to um, to the amount of money that people are going to be putting in. I did give myself a little bit more of a challenge though in mind because what I did do is I did 106% lending. So I didn't assume that I'd have a lower LVR like Jane did in her model. Um, now, I, I, I must admit she did go to, a, I think it was a 90 in terms of what she was doing, but for me, I had 106%, so I needed to find every every dollar of that 250 to make my plan work. Pete, I, I reckon that he's having a lend here. I'm going back to my numbers and I can see a line of credit for deposit and stamp duty. <laughs> There's 106 in mine too. Oh, you did 106 as well. Sorry. I just split it up between 90% and uh, the line of credit against another property. Ah, very good. good line point. item. Sorry, I just... 
<laughs> I was reading your article last night. I had a quick squeeze over it. It was talking something around nine to value ratio, so maybe that's my bad. Oh, I'm, I can't wait to see the suburbs you pull out then, Ben. You know what I mean? I've done? I've done a little bit of preliminary results for my area, Ooh. so I think you'll be excited to know I've got, I've got money in the bank already. <laughs> Peter, you're a little bit quiet there. I'm sure you've got something to say about your situation. Now, you sit somewhere in the middle of all this. Um, the property professor, Peter Kaluza, is at $150 per week. Now, did you have to work as hard as uh, both of them, considering what they did? Well, Effie, I think I had, I had to work even harder than these two slackers because <laughs> I concentrated on properties with high land value, older style houses, in particular character or period style homes. With not only the opportunity for capital growth, but they have proven over the last 10 years to have above average capital growth. Now, just to set the scene, because I know nobody really cares about little old Adelaide. Um, you know, it's either Melbourne, Melbourne or Sydney, or if you're not going to invest there, then you're going to invest in Queensland, probably because you've been on a holiday there at some stage in your life. Five, Do you live in Adelaide, five, Peter? <laughs> How can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jerry. Please go. You wait. You will keep. You will keep. Um, so the seaside suburbs that I picked: Brighton, Glenelg South, and Henley Beach. The Melbourne equivalent would be would be Brighton, or the Sydney equivalent would be Bondi or Manly. So those of you that live in the eastern states, I want you to picture that. The inner city suburb that I picked in Adelaide is a place called Goodwood. In Melbourne, that would be similar to Richmond or Abbotsford. And in Sydney, that would be the same as Paddington or Surrey Hill. Oh, Speak now you that. really well, are well, talking it up. People are going to rush to Adelaide yeah, and want to live in Adelaide, one. Peter. <laughs> no, you can no, imagine no, the no. tourism <laughs> feedback in that particular... It was nothing like what Peter said it was. It's no Paddington. <laughs> Trip advisor. Uh, so, hey, Pete, we'll let you go. The fifth suburb that I picked, is the suburb of Adelaide. You can buy a character or period style house on its own block of land. Admittedly, it'd be a bit small, but it'd be on its own block of land in Adelaide. So you could, if we're looking at the Eastern State alternative, you could buy it in Melbourne or in Sydney. So what I'm presenting uh, at, in this webinar is the opportunity to own property which only costs you 150 bucks a week and you would have it in the suburbs, the equivalent of, of those that I've just mentioned. Richmond, wow. Abbotsford, Can I have Sarah four Hill, of those, Paddington, please? Bondi. I'm tempted. That, mate? <laughs> Can I have four of those, please? <laughs> oh, gee. Okay, I'll go and okay, so... you after this. <laughs> Okay, so look, I, I think we're going to have to wrap it up here because we've just got the opening pieces. So you've heard the opening arguments from each of our experts and I want to make sure that everybody watching tonight can take away as much valuable information as possible. So before we have each of you present with us at your different scenarios, I'd like to ask each of you this question. For someone investing in property for the very first time, what is the first step that they should take? Ooh, well, I'll go first. I guess uh, for me, the people that I speak to who are interested in starting to invest is, is actually setting their goals and understanding what they're trying to achieve. So, you know, often people have a, a goal of, you know, five investment properties or 10 investment properties, but, you know, five investment properties in uh, Goodwood is completely different to five investment properties in Double Bay. <laughs> so I'd say that being actually more specific about their goals and when they want to achieve them, like I would like a passive income for my investments of 50 Fifty thousand dollars in fifteen years' time is probably where to start because your strategy then matches. Okay. Yeah, I can concur with that. Peter. Uh, oh, sorry. Go, Pete. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, look, ben. I agree. I agree one hundred percent with Jane. The first thing that we teach in the property investment course is you need to set your goals first because there's no point going out to look to buy property unless you know what you are looking for, and that'll be determined by your goals. Whether that is to retire richer, retire earlier, supplement your income, uh, work mm. part-time. There's a number of different goals that you can have and different properties in certain locations will help you achieve those goals. So step number one, work out what your goals are. And I concur. Um, you know, this is what I do for a living. This is, you know, we do property investment plans for our clients and the first thing we want to try and teach them is to align 
what this monetary uh, gain is going to do for their lifestyle and what they're trying to achieve, not only financially, but also personally. Mm -hmm. um, and if I expand a bit more on the budget side, um, so a budget is, a, is traditionally a bit of a static um, environment. So we tend to spend more time thinking about um, cash flow um, being an, an ongoing conversation because some households may have the budget or the surplus cash flow now, uh, but they might have change of circumstances like starting a family. So they've got to understand that even though they might be able to afford it for the short term, they've got to be able to hold it for the long term. Mm. So I think from that point of view, doing some cash flow modelling um, to understand your potential and the opportunity to invest is also critical. Okay, okay. Well, look, let's get on to over the first of tonight's scenarios. Um, and how about we start with you, Ben? Uh, ben, your challenge was put, was to put together a case study of an investment property that costs two hundred and fifty dollars per week or less. So over to you, and, and please take us through your strategy and, and the numbers in detail. Sure. So um, with a sort of a framework that we normally use when we're trying to. Um, to decide exactly what we want to do for our clients and for ourselves and we call it our ABCD so it's basically asset selection, borrowing power, cash flow management and defence. So it's all well and good to, to do all you know, the right things. Well we need to sort of put it into a framework that helps us get on that journey. So that's how we've gone about it and that's how I, I've gone about this particular article. So $250 a week is a reasonable surplus and that would normally indicate that the household has some reasonable household income um, that's coming in and, and they're covering all of their uh, expenditure and, and we look at expenditure in sort of um, three ways, bills, spending and then also discretionary and that allows us to, uh, to be able to then identify where there's some capacity for the investor. So th that's what I did and then it comes down to the numbers in regards to you know, looking at the numbers. So um, the numbers that, that, that are important to me was around a 650 purchase price. So I think I was a little conservative. I could have probably pushed that a little bit higher but I wanted to stay within that sort of um, high demand area which meant that there was a lot of underlying demand for properties in those areas that can push values higher and when you're talking about income, there is a really strong correlation between um, uh, the area's income and also the growth that you're going to see in that particular area. So in other words, if you buy an area where there's low income growth, what's going to push the values of properties higher in those locations? So I've gone for 650. Um, I've assumed purchase costs of 5%. Um, so we're talking 32,500. So my total mortgage is 105% at uh, 682,500. Um, then I've got the annualised interest, so I'm assuming a 6% interest rate, so I've been pretty conservative there considering, you know, with the, the Reserve Bank's recent cuts, we're now sort of can buy our money at around uh, under 4%, so there's 200 basis points in spare capacity that I've got there, so maybe I should be buying at around 750 now. Um, no, you should always assume long-term interest rates because interest rates will eventually go up, so you want to be able to assume that you can afford this for the long term. Then I've put in a, a weighting of 1.5% for uh, holding costs um, and that's based against the value of the property and that's indexing at 3%. So that's a good little rule of thumb for the listeners in terms of how you might model that out. Um, I've assumed 5% vacancy, so for every 52 weeks of the year, this property is going to be vacant for five weeks um, of that time period. So uh, that's also, again, I think a relatively conservative approach. Agent fees. Um, net of GST at 7.3%, which gives me a total cash outflow of 52,000. Rental income, I've done 4.5% yield, um, so uh, it's definitely, there's quite a few markets that you can still get that type of yield, so I haven't really focused so much in on the yield, but that comes down to the asset selection story as well. Um, I've got a bit of depreciation in there, um, 5,100 over the year coming through there as well, so total expenditures before tax of 57,778, um, which gives me property income minus cash flow of 23,000. I then assume my negative gearing benefit of $10,555 or 37% marginal tax rates, which gives me a negative cash flow of 12,873, which if you divide by 52, I come under at $248 per week. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. Now in terms of the locations, in terms of the locations, I'm, I'm a borderless investor. I like to 
look outside my own backyard. Um, and I think there are some marketplaces in Melbourne and Sydney which I think are overheated. Uh, and I would suggest that you know you've got to be cautious about the marketplaces you're going into. So I did a bit of a fly around. Um, ACT um, is poised for some growth given very low vacancy rates in houses there at the moment. Shell Harbour is an affordability play um, where we're sort of seeing good connectivity into the Sydney uh, working um, threshold of the CBD, but we're also got that lifestyle drivers of Bayside, Beachside, um, Belmont, 12 kilometres um, from the from the Brisbane CBD um, and long-term established suburb established back in 19 sorry 1894, um, Burley Heads and Palm Beach is a little smoky point, um, fully utilised land on the coast with the most the Gold Coast, um, and then I've gone for an interesting one which I'm sure would have raised the eyebrows for Pete. Um, in South Australia I've gone for Stirling which is up in the hills area um, which is uh, again a beautiful old sort of um, established in the 1850s so some beautiful period homes up there but a bit of a mix and, and certainly that sort of um, tightly held environment up there as well. So a little bit of a mix there and I'll tell you about the results later on in the last in the quarter that I've just analysed to see how I've gone. Okay. Um, Jane, thoughts? Oh, oh impressive start, Ben. <laughs> impressive start. I guess, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, something to live up to. I just have to say that, you know, minus $23,000 a year does hurt a little bit when you see that compared to my numbers, which <laughs> happen to be minus 4000 a year. But, hey, you know, bring it on. Oh, it's all about making money. You've got to spend it to make it. <laughs> Peter? Uh, yeah, Ben has certainly made a strong start, but like Jane, you know, $250 a week out of pocket is a lot of money and all you need is for the property to be vacant for a few weeks and that can really affect the uh, budget. Um, so I'm interested to uh, I'm hear what other five stuff weeks Ben has to say webinar. Five weeks of every year of negative of, of, of vacancy. I've been conservative, please. <laughs> <laughs> You've got five that weeks you of every year, in... mate. You need to change property and... manager. Five weeks of every year. <laughs> no, we've got to teach investors that you've got to make sure you provision and you've got to think worst case scenario. That's part of the defence strategy. You've got to mitigate risk. Well, Belly has a very transient population there, so I think five weeks is very wise. <laughs> um, ben, you, you also threw in a, a tip about stamp duty costs because they do differ um, a, a across um, uh, states. Um, is do. that something that a lot of people should consider when they're putting together a property portfolio? Yeah, definitely. I think um, you know stamp duty is a is a large one-off cost. Um, it for, forms part of the capital base, so we can't we can't write it off unless we're buying in. ACT where you can actually, it's an expense that you can claim um, straight up. So that's that's certainly one of the things. So a nice rule of thumb is 5% in some markets um, depending on how high you're buying for. So if we buy over a million or a mil five in Sydney or Melbourne, um, we put in 6% to 6.5% and you know some areas of Queensland, or sorry not some areas, but some of the stamp duties in Queensland are a little bit lower than some other areas. So a, a good rule of thumb is five, but there's there's some great stamp duty calculators. I'm sure you'll have some on your website there, Effie, in terms of you know where they can calculate mm. some of that borrowing power and those stamp duties. So it's a nice uh, rule of thumb that I've used. Right. Okay, Ben. Look, thanks. Thanks for the tips. Um, now, before we move on to our next case study, I do have a question for our expert panel here tonight. What are the benefits for people buying an investment property in areas they already know well, and should they ever consider buying interstate? Oh, I think uh, Pete should start Peter. with this. Oh, yeah. oh, good. I was thinking the All same right. person. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Adelaide. <laughs> okay, Mr. Adelaide will go first. Um, I thought. I think. Buying in your own backyard is good because you under, in theory you understand the local area and what's happening. However, don't forsake opportunities interstate, especially if you want to uh, catch the, the right wave in that property cycle. But just to give you a couple of examples, like in, in the book that I wrote about the best suburbs to invest in, I mentioned a suburb in the ATC called Narrabunda and people might go ahead and go buy in Narrabunda, but the locals would know in Narrabunda there's two parts. There's upper Narrabunda and lower Narrabunda, and you don't want to be buying property in lower Narrabunda. Or in one of my favourite suburbs in Adelaide, Christie's Beach, you don't want to be buying north of 
Gulf Europe. Or uh, I had actually had a conversation yesterday with a friend of mine from Western Australia who was looking to buy in Adelaide. And he said, Pete, I found a property in Clovelly Park. It looks really good. It's been on the market for a long time. Price is coming down. I said, yeah, but did you realise that there they had found serious contamination from the old Mitsubishi factory nearby and the government had to knock down 20 houses. He said, Pete, I didn't know that. But many, many locals and many Adelaide people would know that. So just to summarise, yes, it's a great idea to buy in your own backyard because you know your own backyard better than anybody else. However, don't forsake the opportunities to buy interstate if you see better options there. Oh, I have some comments on that. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna counter you, Pete. Yeah, I uh, I often speak to people <laughs> who who say uh, I'm gonna I you know I was walking I, even last week two people told me I was walking the dog and noticed a house open for inspection and so good decided to buy it because I know the area so well and sometimes when I challenge them on you know do you know what the median price is the rental yield the past growth the predicted growth the council plans the infrastructure plans the vacancy rates the the typical property for the area they're like. No, but I know the area. I live here. <laughs> so I think sometimes that that parochial kind of I know the area because I live here means that it might be nice for a home, but it may not be suited for a rental property. And I think sometimes those blinkers come on. But as you said, that backyard um, knowledge and just knowing the, the intimacies of those issues uh, gives you a, an advantage if you're buying somewhere that you know. But often, you know, people... Uh, would need to do some research and go to councils and find information to actually get that knowledge or ask around. So um, I, I think buying where you know is sometimes a trap for young players. Well, Jack, can I ask then if you... But I understand where you're coming from. That's okay. <laughs> I mean, Jane, you like to add value to your property. How, how easy is that if you are buying interstate to renovate? Yeah, well, look, yeah, I did a, a renovation remotely. Um, I live in Melbourne on a property that I've had for over 10 years in Sydney last year. And uh, here's a little tip for you. If you have a really good rental manager, they often will actually, you know, manage the, the quotes, etc., for you and, and get those through to you without the cost of maybe a project manager 10% that they would normally charge but or a builder who might manage it for you. But my uh, rental manager went and got me all the quotes and uh, I checked references and went through and, and chose the different people that I wanted to do the job. It was just a quick little, tiny little um, terrace in Darlington and uh, went through and did a new kitchen carpet paint and basically just a refresh for that property and it hadn't been touched in the 10 years since I'd owned it so it did need some some attention and really you know I went up a couple of times and checked on the progress but most of the the tradies were taking little videos or pictures at the end of day for me so I could you know I'm still a bit of a control freak when it comes to project managing my renovations <laughs> even from remotely but it is possible to do it and I think you know uh, if that is a strategy that you have to add value, then, uh, you know, where there's a will and there's a way, there's no doubt there's a little bit of extra work. But mind you, you know, when I was living in Sydney, I'd be up at 5.30 to drive across town, across the bridge to let the tradies in and check on the work and then, you know, come back again and go to work for the day and then do check in the afternoon as well. So, you know, it does take a little bit of effort regardless of whether in your own town or if you're uh, renovating interstate. Okay. Good. Well, look, Peter, we're going to move to you now and um, I look forward to uh, hearing what you did with as little as $150 per week. Okay, so uh, my goal was to look for suburbs with potential capital growth prospects uh, and, a, and they're good because the suburbs proximity to the city or the sea. Because in my opinion, if you're looking for capital growth, historically, the suburbs that have done really well are those that are close to the city or close to the sea. Close to the city is really important because that's where most of the jobs are and generally people like to live uh, close to work and the sea is important for lifestyle. So if you don't have to go to work every day or if lifestyle is really important to you, then living in an area close to water is is also very important. But it's, it's not just about picking the right suburb. In my opinion, you've also got to pick the right type of property in the right street if you want to get the best capital growth property. I focused on properties that have a high land value and low building value 
because in property it's the land that appreciates in value and the building that depreciates in value. So the more of your money that you have invested in the land component, the better off you are going to be so far as capital growth is concerned. So in other words, the older the house the better. Uh, and I like to use the term character or period style which really depicts properties that were built before World War II and in Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane we love our character homes like the old Queenslander homes in Brisbane, Californian bungalows in Sydney, Edwardian Victorian style properties in Melbourne and uh, bungalows and villas and cottages in Adelaide. The assumptions that I made Purchase price $700,000, rent $510 a week, an LVR of 90%, which means you would have to pay lenders mortgage insurance. Now, some people are put off paying lenders mortgage insurance, but I just see it as a cost of doing business. Because if you wait to save up enough deposits so you have a 20% deposit, in the meantime, the property values are going up. So in the scenario that I picked, like a 10% deposit is 70,000. You need to ask yourself, how long is it going to take to save another 70,000 for you to buy that property? And in the meantime, that $700,000 property won't be worth 700,000. It would have increased in value. So in my humble opinion, if you need to pay LMI, it's just a cost of doing business. Now, so the income I already mentioned of $510 a week, but unlike commercial property where the tenant pays most of the outgoings, it's the residential landlord that has, has to pay most of the expenses. Uh, advertising is one, and generally you would do that on the net. Uh, body corporate fees, if you've bought yourself, that's got some, uh, bought yourself a property that's got some uh, common uh, areas, whether it's strata title or community title. Planning, generally speaking, like I've owned property for many, many years and generally your cleaning expenses aren't that huge because in theory the tenant's supposed to be doing that, but you might need to clean from time to time at the end of a tenancy. Same with the gardening, in theory that's the tenant's responsibility. Insurance, that's the landlord's responsibility. Land tax, which is a big issue around the country. Uh, and um, the property that I picked, even though the, the total worth is 700000 because I was looking for a property that had a high land value component, I assumed that the land value was 500000 and in South Australia, if you have land value of 500000 that would attract land tax of $885. Agents letting fees. Now, I noticed Ben put in, I think, 7.3%. Uh, for his scenario, I've worked on an ongoing 7.7% of the rent collected. However, I've also factored in where property managers take, say, up to two weeks rent for every new tenant or one week's rent for renewing a lease. Uh, they'll, they'll charge you for going to the residential tenancies. So I've worked on a slightly higher property management uh, fee. Stationary postage and telephone, that's, that's something that you can claim on when you do your tax um, and that, that's not a huge expense, especially stationary because most, most communication now is done by phone or by email. And another one is, is water. Every state is different. In South Australia, we can charge tenants all water usage uh, and part of the sewerage component, but the, the landlord still needs to pay some of the water and sewerage expenses. So based on annual expenses which total around $41,000 and rental income which worked out to about $25,000 per annum, we had a, a gross minus cash flow of $15,515. I assume that the people were on a marginal tax rate of 32.5% so they got a tax refund of $7,700 and could I just add there, the, the only reason you get a tax refund is because you are making a loss. You know, unfortunately some people go to these property spruiker seminars and they show them these really flash spreadsheets and they say look, you're going to get a $10,000 tax refund if you buy this brand new apartment. Well the only reason you're getting a $10,000 tax refund 
is probably because you're making a twenty or thirty thousand dollar loss. So really, nobody wants to to lose money just to get back thirty two cents in the dollar. So when you work out the weekly cash outflow, it worked out to one hundred and fifty dollars a week. Mm. I like yours, Peter, uh, and not playing favourites because I think you're all brilliant. <laughs> um, this one works really well, I guess. <laughs> yeah, this one works well, I guess, for first home buyers that can't afford a home because you are assuming that they're going to have to pay LMI. The other ones, when you're borrowing over 100%, obviously you, you have to have equity elsewhere. So this one's a nice one that caters to both sides, I, I, I believe. Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll pay you a hundred bucks later. Ben, I'm not playing so, favourite. So, ben, so I'm sure you've got something to argue on this. Please. Yeah, look, oh, look I mean, I, th I thought it come out of the blocks beautifully. I think, you know, there should have been a lot of bullet points. I think people should listen to a lot of what Peter says back. Land to asset ratio assessments, all of that character, owner occupier appeal, that is gold. So make sure you, you take notes of those listeners. I'm only going to critique because I have to, because you know this is about. I'm a, the, the two things I just I just would like to see a little bit more provisioning for maintenance. If I can get away with owning a property for ten years and only have eight thousand dollars in maintenance, I'd be uh, you know sort of doing cartwheels. So you know I, my I provisioned a lot higher for for you know what for basically failures of hot water systems and and general repairs and maintenance. So you know you you put lean on that and occupancy Peter, have you got any thoughts on what you think is reasonable occupancy rates? Yes, yeah, so on my chart I've got a vacancy rate of 5% uh, which is two weeks. Beautiful. Now you might, do, you might do worse than that if you're trying to rent it out late December, early January but depending on the type of property you have uh, and the, the sort of property manager you have, um, it, it might be less than that, but we generally work on a five percent vacancy rate, which means you'd be without rent two weeks a year. Beautiful. Well done. Thank Good. you. Jeez. No argument. What about you, Jane? Oh, look, I, I reckon that... Any flaws uh, in this? Uh, yeah, look, interest rate at 5%, I reckon that you probably need to be conservative once again, long-term interest rates around 7.2575, I'd include that, but, you know, 12% for agent fees, it kind of balances it out <laughs> with, with that argument because, you know, I, we know that we can get, you know, 6% or so, so 12% uh, uh, I think probably makes up for it, so I'm, I'm willing to bow out of that argument. Okay. I agree. You and Ben come up with very valid arguments about when you work out your long-term strategy, you need to have a, a long-term interest rate as well, not just what the interest rate is today. But I, I'm of the thought that I think interest rates for the next 10 years won't be as high as they were for the previous 10 years. That's just my opinion. Mm. No, I concur with that. You're absolutely right. But hopefully we're holding on to the property longer than the 10 years and you're right, I think inside 10 years you're probably looking at the property turning from negative to positively geared um, and obviously Jane's strategy yep. is going to be even earlier than that. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's right. Okay, we've look, We've heard. Or we've already heard two different scenarios um, into uh, covering different locations. Now, my next question I'd like to ask you all is um, the property cycle across different states of Australia. Right now, property is probably you know doing things that we didn't even expect. Is it still the right time to invest, and where should we be investing? Well, I probably didn't answer the last one before about borderless investing, so I'll start off. Um, look, yes, uh, one of the things uh, we're getting more and more educated on is the concept that there are markets within markets, um, and uh, there are cycles occurring in different marketplaces, but also as data becomes more available and more granular, we're also going to see, even if, say, Sydney market might be coming off its peaks or even the Perth market for that matter, we, market, we know is also um, having some negative growth across the median value, there are pockets inside the Perth market that are experiencing growth. Um, and so that's a bit of a message for all new uh, researchers into sort of what makes for good investing is there's no doubt that um, if we look at a broader market, we start to think, oh, you know, I'm not going to touch that market because, you know, the sentiment or the general opinion on that marketplace is where it's at at that time. But there are absolute nuggets of gold inside those markets that may be um, at the bottom of their cycle 
or coming off their off the tops of their cycle. Uh, so being a generalist isn't a great thing when it comes to property investing. You're not you're not investing in the index. You're not investing in the total market. You're picking one property in a great location that you're anticipating is going to have growth through strong owner occupier appeal, and you're trying to pick an investment grade asset. Um, yeah, there's my two bobs worth. And I think um, Pete okay. mentioned that too with the fact that he's talking about it's not just choosing a suburb, it's choosing the streets and the typical property as well. So you have to, you know, not just go, I'm going to invest in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, <laughs> Brisbane. I'm going to invest in this particular suburb in these streets where the renters want to live and this is the typical property that they want. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good point, Jan. I think we, with any type of investment, I mean, you look at when you're choosing, say, a, a managed fund. There are, you know, there are levels within each managed fund. Your asset class and drilling down, and property is exactly what you guys have all been saying. There's markets within markets, and then you drill down even further. Yeah. Um, Jane, you're the lucky last. Um, you would have probably the, the biggest challenge here, just 50 bucks a week and you can have a property. It almost sounds like a scam, um, <laughs> but it's not. It's not. Otherwise, we wouldn't have asked you to do it, that's for sure. But you've got to do it right. So um, over to you. Oh, thank you for recognising how hard this was, Effie. I appreciate that. Maybe next time I can have the $500 a week version <laughs> that Ben's proposed. <laughs> the easy one. Yeah. Well, as you said, look, it is hard, but this this is the thing, you know, and as we know from readers of money magazines, they, um, they're across all walks of life. So, you know, there's some people that may only be able to afford $50 a week out of their cash flow to contribute to a property. And um, what I was really focused on is finding a property or an area that had the predicted growth as Pete pointed out, may not have had the past growth and the proven growth that some of his suburbs um, have had. So it's always nice to have an indication that uh, the area has been popular in the past. And mind you, I I have said that uh, you know this area that I chose, Morrowfield, was has had three percent growth over the last three years. So it has moved up. And um, but I think the important thing for me, and you know. I always go back to my Trident strategy, the three ways of making money out of property. And one is being able to be intimately involved in knowing the market to be able to negotiate and buy below the market and, and try to create some instant equity. The second is to renovate, to add some uh, equity and improve your cash flow by pushing your rent up in the midterm. And then that capital growth, which we all agree on, is what you need to kind of get out of property in the end and have a, a bundle of money to be able to make the decisions and give you the freedom of choice, which is what we're all trying to do with our investments. So, you know, I really concentrated on on an area that is a lot further out than uh, the blue chipper kind of areas that the others <laughs> were able to come up with because I, I set myself a limit of trying to do it un, of a property price. I was under $350,000. So um, as, uh, as Ben pointed out, I did talk about a 10% deposit. So it's a 90% loan to value ratio against the property that's being purchased. So there was mortgage insurance involved and as, as Peter indicated, you know, I see that as an opportunity cost. So um, that's in my one of my line items. But I did actually borrow the rest of that money through a line of credit from another property, which was the stamp duty and um, and the, the actual 10% deposit that I required. So $46,000 came from another property and I took that at a line of credit, which is usually at a higher interest rate. So you can see, you know, I used that around a 7% interest rate and uh, paying um, interest on that. And then I also had the remaining mortgage, the 90% mortgage, which I then, with the mortgage insurance, which I then paid at a 4.59% interest rate, mm. which may seem to go against what I said earlier, <laughs> but I'm locking this Smart down man. for five years fixed to give some security <laughs> to my conservative investor. So they know that they can sleep at night and their interest rates aren't going to change that much. Now, they might be kicking themselves having seen that the RBA earlier this month uh, reduced rates a little, but uh, I don't know if we're going to see much of an increase going forward, as, as Pete said, in the next few years, but I don't think we're going to see them come down a whole lot more than where they are at the cash rate of 1.5%. So I'm just putting that out there on the table. I did take some annual expenses. Usually, having looked over my portfolio over many years and just averaging costs, I usually take 25% uh, of the rent as the cost when I'm just doing back of the envelope numbers. But here, you know, obviously I've broken it down into council rates. Agent fees at 6%. So um, 
which is, you know, I, I think a typical kind of capital city kind of marketplace. Few repairs, bit of outflow. Um, the rental income, once again, I had to really, to bring this weekly cost down, I had to really concentrate on areas that had good yield. So 5.3% was um, the rental yield as being reported in, in this area at the moment. A little bit of depreciation because it's an older style property with land. And um, so after that, and I also took like a, a joint household income of one person on 64000 one person on 76000 So their actual marginal rate was a bit lower than uh, Ben's at 32.5%. So outflow of $30 a week. Now, this could go up to $34 a week if you added in a 2% vacancy rate. But what I really concentrated on in finding a suburb that would deliver this was one that had was under 350000 had a yield over 5%, had a vacancy rate that was lower than 3%. So it's really important. Um, 3% is considered the equilibrium of people looking to rent and properties available to rent. So I wanted an area that actually had more people looking. So I was going to get my property rented sooner. And I wanted to have over 30% renters in the area as well. So this had 32% renters because I want to have a demand. I don't want to be have the only property that uh, everyone's up to rent for. And I looked at four bedroom houses, which census told me was the typical property for the area. And then I went and had a chat to my friends at Residex and at Ripe House and uh, looked at predicted growth and streets where people might look at as well. So there was a number of streets and areas where renters in particular um, congregate. And uh, Residex predicted a 5% growth over the next nine sorry, 9% growth over the next five years and over the next eight years, 7%. So I was ticking the box with older style property that I could renovate and improve. I was ticking the box with rental demand and some growth characteristics. So I reckon I did great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, how about I ask maybe Peter, did you do great? Jane did very well. Jane and I are very good friends. I, I respect <laughs> the research she's done. She, she also finds properties with a, trip, with a twist so she can renovate them. No, but honestly, Jane has done particularly well to find property where it will only cost you $30 a week. And as, as she says, even if the property doesn't grow in value, and it may not, Jane, <laughs> but even if it doesn't grow in value, it's still only costing you in the first year 30 bucks a week. And if, even if that went for 30 years, then the tenant virtually is paid off, more than paid off your loan mm. and you have an asset there that you virtually didn't have to pay for. So that's pretty good. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> uh, ben, it, do you concur? Let the tyres down. <laughs> no, I'm not going to let the tyres well, down. <laughs> Jane's strategy, the Trident strategy, is a proven formula. This is what I love about it. It's a framework that you follow to try and get the right outcome. I will say... Um, I'm, I'm curious around the concept of um, a high number of renters in the street. I, I, I'm keen if you could expand on that for me, Jane, and because for me, you know, um, street appeal, streetscape, um, household house presentation um, is important. So mm. do, you, do you factor that into your consideration around, you know, I know you're understanding that you want to have a, a strong rental demand mm. there. I'm, I'm curious as to why it's important to have that at street level. Yeah, look, really good question because what you're, you're uh, picking up on is you don't want to have 100% renters in the street because that kind of uh, looking after mm -hmm. your backyard and, and mowing the medium strip and, you know, you know I'm not going to make an assumption having been a rent fester for 10 years myself, but uh, yeah, that you, know, you don't know your, your neighbour or look after them. But, <laughs> you know, it's more of a transient population, let's say. They're not the 9, 10, yeah. 11 years kind of people who stay in an area. So I do have a cap on it. I'd go up to about 70%. But when I look at the census information and I look at the suburbs and I look down to the street level, I can very clearly see the streets where the renters want to be. And, you know, usually in capital cities, they're congregated around 500, you know, to 800 metres from um, public transport hubs, maybe a bus or tram or train station. So, you know, that's and that's a kind of rule of thumb, but I want to be where the renters want to live. I don't want to be on the outskirts where, you know, most of the houses are owner-occupied. Now, 
as a, a, a different strategy completely, if I was going to flip a property, buy, renovate and sell, I want to know exactly where those owner-occupier streets are and that demand is because that would be the market that I'd be selling to. So I'd be targeting those streets. So that's why I get down to that level. But you're right, I wouldn't be looking for 100% renters. I really want that kind of uh, the base foundational people there that are going to be there for the long term, take pride in their areas and improve and gentrify their own properties and bring up the value of mine. Hmm. Okay, so thanks Jane. Look, okay, so we've now heard all three scenarios and they're, they're three very different scenarios but they do have things in common here as well. So what I would like to do now is explore some of these commonalities and by doing so some of the fundamentals that are best practice when it comes to investing in property. Jane, I'm going to pick on you to start first. Thank you. Well, I think um, what the listeners have probably picked up on is that uh, Ben and Peter and I, although we're we're friendly rivals, we uh, we actually really respect each other and their and, and their opinions, and we have very similar opinions. And you know that land value, the typical type of property, which is usually a house for an area, looking at good capital growth and rental demand, but fundamentally, as you've seen with us going through the numbers, we all agree that you have to get the numbers right before you even buy a property because I think one of the worst things can happen is we talk to people who are very excited about finally being able to afford a property and then all of a sudden they get hit with these extra costs and they're a shock and they don't know how to manage their cash flow. So, you know, with all due respect, I think, you know, all of us have a very healthy understanding of knowing the numbers first before you buy and uh, would, would want people to know that. Yeah, look, I agree 100% there with Jane. The only other thing that I would add is to reinforce the land value if you're looking for capital growth uh, and do the numbers. Buying an investment property should not be an emotional decision. It might be if you're buying your own home to live in, but buying an investment property needs to be about the numbers. If the numbers don't work, don't worry about it. Move on because the deal of a century will come along next week or next month. And Ben, I mean, what did you see as a thread that was similar between uh, the three scenarios here? I think in listening to everyone, we're, what we're overlaying is this concept of supply and demand. We're trying to find uh, where demand exceeds supply and we're trying to look at it from a, from a viewpoint that then allows us to identify what we would consider is an investment grade area and then potentially an investment grade property. We don't want to be caught up in the whole concept of investment stock where we might be buying areas where there's, a, there's a, a, an abundance of land um, so there's no scarcity factor associated with that. And, and in terms of we all say the same things but probably just in different ways but we're also studying the human behaviour, the, the biopsychology, so the human interest and human behaviour story which uh, for me is, is trying to identify those owner occupiers and, and their interest in living in an area and then sort of getting on the back of those because they control 70% of the marketplace. So they're the price makers and we're the price takers. So I think we all agree, Peter was saying it before around, you know, character homes and, and you know, sort of status associated with that and, and for Jane, she was referring to, you know, uh, what she was talking about in regards to renters um, congregating close to transport nodes and those types of things. So, you know, we're studying um, you know, the practical reasons why we choose the shelter that we choose and I think that's, you know, there's a message in that for all, um, you know, new, newcomers to property investing and also for us seasoned investors, um, you know, we're trying to understand that science and those nuances. Okay. Look, I want to shake things up a little bit now. You mean you've been so good and convincing with your numbers and your strategies for each of your scenarios. I'm going to throw a bit of a twist here. Mm -hmm. I'd like to completely turn the tables and get each of you to argue against your own scenario. Cool. <laughs> but this is going to be... <laughs> yes, and you were so convincing, Jane, that yours was the best and the way to go and that your numbers were right. Um, so, look, I'm going to start with you since I heard you laugh. Oh, um, what are some of the negatives? I'm going to ask what are some of the negatives mm -hmm. or the risks around the scenario that you put forward? Look... Be objective here. Yes, I will. I, I you know... I'm going to put my engineer hat on and my risk assessment hat on and and, yep. and this is how I do assess suburbs and I did indicate some of these issues in the article. Um, this area, that Moreton Bay kind of area where Morrowfield kind of tips into, there's a lot of developers taking up 
um, uh, opportunities in that area as well. So I think there's some risk of the fact that a couple of risks associated with that. Uh, harder to find properties because you know they're they're paying a lot of money to uh, add value in different ways. There's also um, some issues with the fact that there could be a flood of rental properties that may not be characteristic of what the area has been in the past. And we think about um, exactly what uh, Ben was saying about understanding the the buyer and the demographic for an area. We get that information from census. I'm very excited that uh, census has been done in August, but you know we're still relying on information that now is over four years old that we're we're looking at. So you know there may have been some changes that we're making some assumptions on, but. You know, one of the key characteristics of being 38 kilometres out from the CBD is usually there's some kind of socioeconomic issue. So you might have um, a uh, tenants that are, you know, blue collar, et cetera, rather than professional, which you, you often find closer to the CBD. There may or may not be associated issues with that that could be crime related, et cetera. Um, and also, you know, one of my favourite strategies is renovation, but I'm very, very clear on the fact that you need pricing disparity between unrenovated and renovated properties within an area to be able to justify doing a renovation and making a profit. And at those lower price points, $350,000, it's a lot harder than at the six fifty, seven hundred thousand dollars 700000 that my uh, fellow colleagues are uh, pricing their strategies at. <laughs> Jane, can I ask, the lower price point would make me look towards, okay, I can easily find a unit around that price. Mm. Is that an added risk here? I think the, a problem is that if people go, oh, look, I found an area and the area is Morrowfield and oh, I just can't afford that, so I'm going to buy a unit here instead. The, the problem is that you have to actually start your entire analysis again based on units because your initial an analysis, maybe you were looking in New Farm, for instance, in Brisbane. You couldn't afford that and you went, well, I'll buy a unit here instead. It may not be the typical property for the area. It may not have the rental demand. So, you know, just flipping it could be a problem. So if you do say 350000 is not going to get me where I want to be within 20 k's of CBD, I want to have a, a unit that's within a, um, a closer proximity to where people want to live and work and it will be you know an older style unit uh, less than four stories I'd suggest so you don't have the big strata fees to go with the swim, <laughs> swimming pools and the, the lifts but uh, you can do that but you have to start your analysis again. Okay. Peter I'm going to ask you the same question uh, what are some of the negatives or the risks uh, for instance around the scenario that you put forward? Well probably the greatest risk is the uh, the fact that not only does it cost you more than Jane's scenario, $150 a week, and that assumes you have the tenant, the big risk comes if you don't have a tenant. If for whatever reason it's very hard to rent, it might be the wrong time of the year, or like I'm, I'm hearing now that in Brisbane it's actually quite hard to rent property because there's an oversupply. To do without $350 a week in Jane's scenario is far more manageable than my scenario where you were earning five hundred and ten dollars a week, so you can mm. you can last a lot longer if you're only losing three hundred and fifty bucks a week instead of five hundred and ten. So for people who are a bit worried about can they handle that, firstly you should have had a cash buffer in the beginning to make allowances for higher vacancies, higher maintenance, because the other the other alternative is. To go to say Jane's strategy, where you outlay less money, so her property is worth is half the price of mine, but her negative cash flow is well below that of mine. So you need to, as Ben mentioned earlier, you need to make allowances for uh, unexpected occurrences. You should have a a cash balance or a line of credit that you can access. Um, so when these things do happen, you're not panicking. Like at the moment, there is a lecturer uh, at where I work at uni who's in exactly the same position. She has a relatively new property in a regional area in New South Wales. And whilst the market was going really well in New South Wales the last two or three years, you know, we'd meet two or, every two or three weeks over a coffee and she'd tell me how rosy everything was. But now it's not so rosy. The property's been vacant for a month. And she's seriously looking at selling because she do, she didn't have that cash buffer. So yes, there can be great returns in property, but you also need to account for the risks. 
And moving forward, if I can ask you, Peter, yields. Again, depends where, which pocket of the market you're in, um, because they've taken a bit of a hit. Uh, what, what do you see the next, um, you know, 12 months to, to 24 months looking like? Yeah, look, that, to me, that is very surprising, Effie, that rents have actually dropped over the year, which to me shows mm -hmm. there's either less demand because there's less people going out looking for places to rent, or there is an oversupply. And I tend to think it's more the latter especially with the number of units coming on to the market, or I should say apartments, in particular in Brisbane and in Melbourne. So hmm. I think overall rents won't be increasing that much. Uh, we did have it good for, for many years. And I think landlords, to mention that word price takers that Ben said before, uh, landlords will be the price takers. They won't be the price makers. Now, it's okay to be asking five hundred ten dollars a week, but if you can't get it, there's only a certain amount of weeks that you can be without rent. So you're just going to have to drop that rent. So you need to factor that in as well. Okay, great. And last but not least, Ben, the same question for you: What are some of the negatives or the risks, for instance, around the scenario that you put forward? Yeah, I think there's there's a couple. I'll expand on Peter's point around. Um, you know, when you're taking a value position like we are, where we're sort of saying at the top end of your, potentially of your household budget, any change in circumstances can can damage um, that position and you'll have that for sale. There's nothing more um, devastating to trying to build household wealth that when you buy a property given, you know, you're buying it at the higher level and you're paying higher stamp duty and you're paying higher interest. If you can't let that asset mature, I have a little saying, it's a bit like a, a beautiful cab sav, a really heavy cab sav. If you try and drink that cab sav in the first one or two years, it's going to be spoiled. It's not going to be good drinking at all. But if you're going to play in this sort of higher end space where you're grabbing the higher value properties, your, your, your good drinking is 10, 15 years down the track and that's what these properties will do. They will deliver you stellar capital growth um, if you're trying to play at that higher end um, where there's obviously greater scarcity and potentially better locations that you can buy. Um, the other one is probably uh, one about diversification. Um, if you're going to put all your eggs into the one basket and try and grab a significantly higher asset, you've got to be pretty confident that your asset selection and your location selection is pretty good. So there is a real risk um, in sort of going at the top end of the market and trying to select the right suburbs and then the right types of property in that area. So you know, some people might adopt a more diversified approach where they, they might have, um, you know, sort of two $350,000 assets as opposed to a 700000 I mean, they're the considerations that each household should make around determining, you know, what sort of budget they want to take into, uh, into their investment property strategy. Great. Now, uh, so with your scenario though, though Ben, I mean, what would be the, the, the thing that you would uh, hate to see reverse? What, what would um, kind of knock your, your scenario out completely? What's the worst case thing that I, could happen? Yeah, I still think of the, the sort of price point. If I fly around the country and I look at what $650,000 can buy me, that's going to buy me yeah. a significant house in Hobart, but it's not even going to mm -hmm. buy me a one-bedroom apartment in Darlinghurst. So the, the reality is, is um, you know, there's, there's, market, there's that sort of same line of the markets within markets. So I've got to be conscious of what, what I'm buying here. In the, right. in the areas that I chose, um, you know, I've gone in some cases to be closer to the city um, and in other cases I've gone to more lifestyle centres um, that, are, that are offering strong owner-occupier appeal and tightly held assets. And, and so again, it comes down to you know, doing that research. Um, the thing that will knock me out of the park is more around cash flow and vacancy. Uh, but if I provision for that, I shouldn't have a problem. Um, but I also know that, you know, given uh, in the biggest cities of Melbourne and Sydney, my 650,000 is around, you know, is under median for both areas. Mm -hmm. So the, the reality for me is there's still plenty of fool's gold um, in rising tides lifting all ships and that means that interest rates are really low so you get a natural asset appreciation when you see interest rates as low as they are. The real question is going to be is will these prices hold when interest rates eventually do turn around? They're, I'm with Pete, there's going to be a long time before they 
turn around to maybe six or seven percent. But the reality is, if you know how many households are going to be able to afford when they've stretched their family budget, and this is not only investors because investors get caught up in owner occupiers who are buying with emotion too much in the outer fringes. And then what happens there is if they lose their jobs in an economic downturn or if there's you know, interest rate rises but they're, they've been you know, buying um, these uh, interest-free couches and, and all this sort of stuff on credit, well that, you know, that credit will bite and then we'll start to see some mortgage distress sales and, and those values may not hold up. So you want to really make sure that the area that you're buying in you're testing the income against that area to make sure that you don't have that risk of a real downturn in values if you're going to buy in some of those more speculative areas. Okay, so look, thanks Ben. So here's the clincher. Looking at each of these three different scenarios and the assumptions and the numbers behind them, which one of these would you actually personally choose yourself? I'll start with you, Peter. And I'm not saying it just because I did it, but I would go with mine because $150 a week for me is a manageable amount to be negatively geared. Ideally, I would love to only be $30 a week out of pocket. However, generally speaking, those sorts of areas, <coughs> as I think Jane has already alluded to, may have less capital growth than other prime areas. And for me, I'm investing in property for the capital growth because the profit in property comes from the capital growth. The rent just pays the bills. But you still need that rent to pay the bills because you know the cash flow is the lifeblood of any business, whether it's running a, a shop or whether it's running your property investment portfolio. So for me, $150 a week is manageable, plus I should get uh, pretty good capital growth if I buy the right property in the right street in the right suburb. Okay, Peter. So you're saying you can't get capital growth on the price range that Jane had? Well, and I, I've already had a, a few guys at Jane, so I don't want to have... <laughs> Bring it on! <laughs> yeah. Bring it on! I was just a bit confused what you said then. I just thought, oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, the problem is you... more I feel... More I feel is a long way from Brisbane. I, I'm not sure what is going to drive capital growth. One of the things that I said early on was most people like to live close to work and the CBDs of our capital cities have the highest mm -hmm. concentration of jobs, in particular white collar professional jobs where people earn you know, a fair bit of money. You know, We have, especially here in, in Adelaide and in other places around Australia, as much as I hate to admit it, people are, our young people are flocking to Sydney and Melbourne. And not because they can get a job in a factory, because they've been to uni for four or five years, they can't get a job in their local area, so they head off to somewhere near the CBD of Sydney or Melbourne, where they are likely to find that accounting job, that law job, or that managerial position. So you have a lot of demand mm -hmm or properties near the CBDs where jobs are. But unfortunately, poor old Moore, I feel. <laughs> going to Sorry, Jane. I also mentioned Kingston, Sorry to bring that up. Kingston in Queensland <laughs> and Glen... I don't even know how to pronounce it. Glenorchy in Hobart. <laughs> I had other areas. <laughs> I just did my numbers. I'll move it on for you, Jane. I'll, I'll bring up. So, so I'll come to your defence, Jane. I'll come to your defence. I think what, you know, you had the toughest brief and so what you're looking at there is timing the market growth as opposed to mm. long-term historical growth. So there will be areas like more I feel which will have the wave rider growth where the value and you, you become part of that affordability story yeah. and part of that affordability story you will be picked up like the tide of the wave rider that goes out into those markets. So if you, if you time well there you will enjoy an uplift in capital growth the question then is, will that be maintained for the longer term? And in some cases, if it's gentrified um, to a degree, then you know that'll that'll potentially uplift it. But ultimately, for me, it's a timing strategy mm -hmm. as opposed to a uh, you know a proven long-term strategy, as your data told you, which was it had been relatively flat, but it was predicted to take that next leap forward in regards to the next area that's going to be impacted by that wave rider affordability story. 
Absolutely, I agree. And completely. very well put. Does does that mean you accept Jane's as the one that you would do? <laughs> no, no, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, there's there's two things. Personally, um, I'm a I'm a what I, you know I don't want, the word I use is a true investor. So I'm interested in investing for a return. I'm I'm a passive investor. So the same way I might study a company and look at it on the share market and see its drivers and look at the opportunity there and look at its market value, I do exactly the same thing when I'm looking at investing in property. So I'm going to let my skill as a researcher and my skill as a selector in finding the best property and then I'm going to let the property do its thing and I'm going to get back on with my life. Um, I'm not a hands-on active investor which means that I don't, you know, I don't cultivate or equity harvest and those types of things. I just buy assets based on, on the research and I let my research do the talking in terms of the growth that occurs. In addition to that, when I sit in front of clients and do my property advisory work, um, I look at their cash flow position and I'll always chose, chase growth if they've got strong surpluses. I'll chase yield and potential um, sort of balance strategy if they've got lower cash flow. So, you know, I'm good to my word. Capital growth is absolutely um, fundamental in what I'm trying to find for the client. So, if you've got really strong surpluses, I'm going to chase higher value properties in scarcer, more desirable locations. Um, but if I've got clients who for whatever reason have small surpluses, I'm going to look at Jane's idea and, and if they're interested in getting their hands dirty in equity harvesting, that's a proven strategy. Jane's an expert at it, uh, but that's effectively what you know I'd be advising based on case by case on those personal circumstances. Okay, thanks Ben. Uh, Jane, keen to hear which strategy you would adopt? Well, like Ben and Peter, I am actually a, an advocate of you know the land value and um, having the best quality property in the best area that you can afford. And hence, I really like their strategy. It's it's consistent with my low risk um, strategy in being able to you know be close to the CBD and the infrastructure of where you know mainly professionals are living. So. It was really tough looking at Ben and Peter. I mean, I'm a very, very frugal person myself, so 150 bucks a week is a whole lot better than $250 a week. Not in Adelaide, though. I just have to say, I just don't. I don't think I could. I could do that. But one of the things that um, I think you know we have to be uh, aware of here is that um, you know for the nine percent growth in Morrowfield and a $350,000 property, I'm going to get close to maybe you know. $35,000 a year. Pete's strategy at $700,000 property only has to return a 5% growth to get the same amount of equity gain. So, you know, it's really uh, finding that kind of growth capital, growth uh, potential in the lower price points is very, very difficult. Is possible, makes you do a lot more work to, to achieve it. But as renovation is one of my key strategies as part of the Trident strategy, finding that pricing disparity is very difficult with um, in one suburb finding the unrenovated and the renovated properties that have such a disparity in price that I can make a profit and pay for my holding costs and my renovation costs. I'm looking usually at properties 650 and above to be able to achieve that. So I would, uh, I would say the only thing that... Uh, Mm, pulls me back on Pete's strategy is that he has to actually come up with a 70000 in the stamp duty first of all and I like the equity strategy that Ben has and I think the price point of Pete's would probably be pushed up quite a bit if we threw in the extra 10% and the stamp duty on the costs there. So somewhere in between is where I'm going to place it but if I have to make a call, it's with $150 a week. Oh, there we have it. Peter, you must be feeling good. <laughs> Peter's probably feeling very good. <laughs> oh, look, for himself, <laughs> Jane, Jane, before you, we that, did... before you make that final decision, can I just say I did some data on the areas that I picked for money. In So this is CoreLogic RP data. December 2015 was the suburb value price. So I'll give you a couple. Burley Heads had a $665,000 median house price. Um, in the March quarter, that had moved up to seven seven hundred and five thousand, so it's a forty thousand nine hundred dollar gain in three months. See, that's my that's um, my so gain in one year. <laughs> More yeah, than my yeah. gain in one year, it might be great. Palm Beach, the neighbouring suburb that I picked, had a thirty thousand dollar gain or five percent gain in three months. 
Um, you know, Shell Harbour had a $22,500 gain in three months. Um, and then my others, which were Belmont, had 7500 Um Sterling, Peter, in your Adelaide Hills area, 32500 gain in three months. And my only dud was Fadden so far in the ACT, which has had no gain. Oh, well, three months. Don't be harsh on yourself. It's a long-term play, oh, no. right? <laughs> what, what about you, Pete? Have you made any money? <laughs> Have I made any money? Yeah, Have you made... not investing in more rates? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you are. Harsh. He won't let that go, really. No, no. He won't no. let that go. I think it's because I said no, I wouldn't invest in it. I, um, as, as many people would know, I wrote a book a few years ago about the best others to invest in, and I selected 107. And five years after I wrote the book, I revisited it. And I, I did a few seminars around the country called the Property Professor or the Property Pretender. And I'm pleased to announce that every single suburb that I had written about had increased in value greater than its respective city. But the big task comes for the 10th anniversary because as we've talked about here, generally property is a long-term play to see if those 107 suburbs have continued to outperform their respective capital city. We will see put you to the test on that. Look, we've covered a lot of ground in this webinar. Uh, yeah, I think you guys have done brilliant to be able to, to bring what you've written for Money Magazine and make it come to life. I've really enjoyed listening to your copy rather than reading all your copy all the time. <laughs> and we've heard a lot of problems as well um, that you should avoid and good underpinnings that all successful investing has in common. Uh, and I guess it's knowing this information that gives you clarity. There are the fundamentals that inform the most important investment decisions you make. Um, it's been a huge event tonight. I hope you got a lot of value out of the content that we've brought together to, to tonight. And um, I will stick to my guns here and continue with that promise. I'll give away one year subscription to Money Magazine. So I hope you've been listening because there was that question I said I was going to ask. But first, if you can do me a favour, take a moment now and just type in the chat panel what have been some of the aha moments for you tonight. We really want to know. We want to find out what, what you found was valuable. So I hope you enjoyed this friendly discussion. There is a serious side to property investing and I, I do hope you gain some insight into the different considerations and costs that you need to be aware of. Now you never know, if you like this shootout, we might even do it again. So let us know if we've hit the mark and if there are any topics that you want to hear about. So type this into the chat box. So now to the giveaway. I'm going to give away one four year subscription to Money Magazine to the first person who answers this question correctly. What percent number did Jane Slacksmith say when she meant that the vacancy rate was at equilibrium? What's the percent that the vacancy rate is at equilibrium? If you, if you answered 3%, that is absolutely correct. I'll also give out a free copy of Money Magazine Real Estate 2016 Guide to the first five people who answered who John is messaging now. So if you get a message from John, stick around for a minute after the webinar ends and we'll give you the details to send out the prizes. And if you miss out on that, remember you can get it at magshop.com.au. So I'd like to thank all our special guests tonight. Okay, first of all, Ben Kingsley, the Chair of Property Investment Professionals of Australia and Director of Empower Wealth at empowerwealth.com.au. Peter Kaloutsis, the Property Professor, Author, Teacher and the National Coordinator of Property Investing Training at TAFE SA. And you can find out more about Peter at thepropertyprofessor.net.au. And author, educator, an all-round nice person too, Jane Slacksmith. Now you can find out more about Jane at yourpropertysuccess.com.au. Well, that's it for tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of the evening and bye for now.